good afternoon, good evening, or in fact, good morning to you all, depending on where in the world you are joining us from today. I'm Rachel Sampson, the University of Glasgow's Vice Principal of External Relations, and it is my real pleasure to warmly welcome you to the University of Glasgow's World Changing Glasgow Conversations. This is our flagship virtual event series that brings together individuals and ideas at a time when connection has never been more important, whilst also allowing us to engage with you, our team, U of G community around the world. In the audience today, we have alumni, staff, students, partners, and friends, and a very special welcome to those prospective students also joining us in the audience today. You have made an excellent choice in applying to the University of Glasgow. Please do use the chat function that you set up to say hello and tell us where you're joining us from um, across the globe. So on to today's topic. Uh, this theme of the event today is on mental health and suicide prevention and given the very sensitive nature of this topic I would first like to point you in the direction of the resources available within the chat. You will see that we have uh, pinned some links to the top of the chat for both of our partners who are joining us in today's event the Scottish Association for Mental Health and the Samaritans. We would ask that you don't post personal details within the chat, but if you do require support, please do access it directly through the links provided. Now, with public health measures such as lockdown being in play for the last year, uh, I think there is a real recognition that these have been necessary to protect the general population from the effects of COVID-19 but they have had a real impact on people's mental health and well-being and that impact is likely to be profound and long-lasting. Investigating the trajectory of mental health and well-being is crucial to giving us a better understanding of the challenges people face. However, mental health and well-being challenges are not sadly exclusive to the pandemic. The University of Glasgow's Institute of Health and Wellbeing is a global leader in research into population health and health inequalities and boasts a world leading group focusing on mental health and wellbeing. The quality and relevance of the Institute's work has inspired a lot of support in recent years, including from the Peers Foundation, and I do believe that we have representatives of the Foundation joining us today, and I'd therefore like to take this opportunity to thank them for partnering with us, particularly for their very generous support of the new home for the Institute, the Claris Pears building. And those of you in Glasgow may have noticed it taking shape at the corner of Byers Road and University Place. Indeed, partnership is central to the Institute's approach and we are delighted to bring together today an expert panel drawn from the Institute and its partners to share how mental health and wellbeing, and in particular suicide prevention, is everyone's business and how we can work together to ensure that no one has to face these things alone. We have with us today Professor Rory O'Connor, Professor of Health Psychology in the Institute of Health and Wellbeing and President of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. Uh, joining Rory are Billy Watson, who is CEO of the Scottish Association for Mental Health, and Dr. Uh, Elizabeth or Liz uh, Scowcroft, who is Head of Research from the Samaritans. So our sincere thanks to all of you for joining us today for what I think is an incredibly timely and important discussion. So Rory is going to open by sharing some of his research in this area, and then we'll bring uh, both Billy and Liz into the discussion to answer some of the questions posed many of which have been pre-submitted by attendees, so thank you very much for those. But we will also keep a very close eye on the audience chat in order to try and respond to any pertinent themes. Um, but please do bear with us because it may not be possible to pick up and address every question during the time we have. And on that note, because time is precious um, and there's an awful lot to discuss, Without any further ado, I am going to hand over to Rory to get us started. So thank you, Rory, and over to you. 
Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Rachel, and welcome um, colleagues and friends from uh, across the globe in our um, the family, the Glasgow University family. And I'm delighted in particular to be talking today on a panel with Billy and Liz, who I've worked with over the last number of years, both in a research and also in a policy and practice context. And I suppose one of the key messages I'm hoping to convey is that the science and research that we're involved in here at the Institute of Health and Wellbeing, and in particular within the Suicidal Behaviour Research Lab, is only possible through partnership. Partnership from people with lived experience of suicide and self-harm, and be that people who are bereaved by suicide or those who struggle uh, to stay alive or who have attempted suicide, as well as working with as, as a, our partners in providing services and support as both um, Sam Ardens and Sam H do. So I think my slide should appear and I'm hoping this then get the clicker to work um, effort, effortlessly. So I've been involved in suicide research for now 25 years. And so what I'm gonna try and do is, is maybe give you a sense of some of the work that we've been doing, but also help us understand what is at the heart of this most tragic, most tragic human phenomenon? And, and then through that understanding will hopefully help us inform prevention, how we can help and support people who do struggle daily, as well as those who are bereaved by suicide. Now, um, to do that, I'll say something about the scale of the challenge that we face. I think it's important also to challenge some of the myths around suicide. Now, as I, as I said already, I've been working in this area for many years. And what's been rewarding has been, see, has been seeing how some of those myths have been challenged and, and they have been hopefully demolished. But sadly, many of them still remain. And then I'll move on to just giving a sense of a theoretical model that I developed uh, in 2011 and then update it with my colleague Olivia Kirtley in 2018. And that model is helping us try to understand why suicidal thoughts emerge in some people and why they lead to suicidal behavior in others. And one of my take home messages will be that the factors that lead to suicidal thoughts are often different from the factors that lead somebody to attempt suicide or sadly die by suicide. And then I'll touch on some warning signs that we can all sort of think about if we're trying to um, look at maybe risk in others. And then I'll touch on COVID-19 and some of the work that we've been doing with Sam Ardens and Sam H, as well as other work I've been doing with international colleagues on really trying to understand the impact. And then I'll leave us with some thoughts, some considerations, challenges, and opportunities for all of us, which hopefully will set the scene for starting some of the discussion which we're hoping to have tonight. So with that, in that context then, with that background, um, oh, we're gonna move. Uh, with that background, just to give you some sense of the scale of suicide. So sadly, we know that 800,000 people um, lose their struggles to live um, each year across the globe. So three, three, 800,000 people die by suicide each year somewhere in the world. And indeed, if we look then at the sort of the, the scale of the ripples of suicide, in recent research published from the, from the United States estimates that something like 135 people will know an individual who's died by each individual who's died by suicide. So if you translate that into numbers, that's 108 million people potentially affected or potentially who knew people, the person who died by suicide. So we look at that in stark terms, that's globally, every 40 seconds, I should say every 40 seconds, one person dies by suicide. And 20 people in that time will also attempt suicide. So you think about people who've attempted suicide, that is them, we've got somewhere like 16 million people attempt suicide each year, um, in addition to those 800,000 who, who lose or struggle to live. So the scale is vast. If we just think in the UK context, three quarters of all suicides are by men. And that suicide is the leading cause of death, the leading cause of death amongst men aged 35 to 49. And amongst both men and women, the leading cause of death in those aged 20 to 34. So I think that's worth pondering for a second. It is literally the leading cause of death 
in some age groups of men and women. And I mean, that's a really stark statistic and really highlights the scale of the challenge that we face. Now, at the Suicidal Behavioural Research Laboratory, over, over many years now, we've been conducting research of many different types and forms. Our research, as I said at the outset, is inter interdisciplinary, both with key different partners to help us understand suicide, but different scientific and academic perspectives. So I'm a psychologist, but we work obviously closely with our, our psychiatric colleagues, our po policymakers, as I said already, people with lived experience, and others who really have a, with an interest and an understanding, which we, by bringing these different understandings together, can help us understand and prevent suicide. And the research that we do has been funded from a whole range of sources, but that research can be, oftentimes it's experimental type work. So we may be looking at how the body responds to stress to try and identify mechanisms by which cortisol or the cortisol system may be implicated in sort of vulnerability to suicide, the sort of crucial to the fight or flight response. We may look at the impact of trauma on individuals' cortisol system, but also how maybe childhood trauma we carry with this risk. And what we're trying to identify then is in individuals who are vulnerable, how can we then intervene to protect them? Or we do research on sort of large scale community-based studies in which we're trying to get a sense of the scale of suicidal thoughts, the scale of self-harm, the scale of self-harm and suicide attempts in particular groups. Because if we can identify who is especially vulnerable, again, we can tailor our response and hopefully target those who need, need most um, help and support. We also do a lot of clinical based work in which often in some of our studies, we, we uh, work with people within 24 hours of a suicide attempt to really understand what are the psychological and social and broader char characteristics which were associated with their suicidal episode, their suicide attempt. And often we may track people over time in a confidential and anonymous way and with their consent to get a sense of, can we predict who's most vulnerable? Because if we can predict who's most at risk and identify these warning signs, again, it gives us a target, a target for treatment and intervention. And that's the last bit I'll mention in terms of the work that we do in a clinical context is we do work in which we try and identify or develop new interventions, new brief or more longer term psychological or psychosocial interventions. We've recently done work on how we keep people safe, what's known as safety planning, building and collaboration with colleagues in the United States who develop safety planning, Barbara Stanley and Greg Brown in particular. But the key message is what we're trying to do is bring together the evidence to inform practice. And through that evidence theory informed approach, we can hopefully help to save lives. Now, in terms of the sort of myths I mentioned at the outset, we think of myths, sadly, there are too many remaining. And, and in terms of the myths I want to focus on now, um, it co coincidentally, I have a, a book, uh, it sounds like a plug, it's not meant to be a plug, but it just so happens that I have a book which sort of summarizes a lot of the research that I've done over the last 25 years, bringing it together with people's lived experience, people's stories of people who've been bereaved as well as been suicidal. But in part of the book, at the early part of the book, we touch on some of those myths. So I just want to say a couple of words about some of those myths for the purposes of tonight or this evening. The first myth I want to mention is number four on this list, which is asking about suicide plants the idea in people's head. And I know certainly from working this, uh, say over many, many years, that that myth still persists, that often people are frightened to talk about suicide, frightened to ask that difficult question, are you suicidal? Now, from all the research that's been conducted internationally, we know that asking that question could get people the help and support that they require. There's no evidence that it plants the idea in their head, but rather it could be the start of a life-saving conversation. People, number five, people who are suicide clearly want to die. That's just not the case. And again, from the psychological work that we and others have done, we know that ambivalence is this sort of waxing and waning, this wanting to live versus wanting to die, that ambivalent nature is characteristic of the suicidal mind. And indeed, one of the key messages from all the work that we've been doing is that suicide is not about wanting to end your life. It's about wanting mental pain to end. 
And the other one I would like to highlight just for purposes of today is it says here that suicide cannot be prevented. Well, suicide is preventable. It's difficult to prevent. And my heart goes out to loved ones who have lost people to suicide. And I've lost two important people in my life to suicide. And the pain is just unbearable. But, but what we have to is think about the messages of hope so that we can prevent that loss in others. And suicide is preventable up until the very last moment. So if you are concerned about somebody, please reach out. And if you're concerned about yourself, please, there is help out there. And that's something we hopefully touch on in the discussion. So just that's just to give you a taster of some of the myths. I want to just move on to a sort of our thinking around understandings around suicide. And again, I, I mentioned in the outset that in 2011, I published a, a theoretical model of suicide, which I attempt, my, was my attempt to bring together the sort of theoretical understandings, integrate um, why we think people die by suicide. And that led to the IMV model or the Integrated Motivational Volitional Model, which is a bit of a, a mouthful. And what it illustrates is this pathway, the complex set of pathways from having background vulnerability through to what leads people to become suicidal in the first place through to the right-hand part of the model here on the, uh, the volitional phase is people who act on their thoughts of suicide. So just for a second, I just want to focus in on in the central, the core bit of the model, the motivational phase. And that's trying to understand why suicidal thoughts emerge in some people. Why is it some people think of suicide when times are tough and others don't? And according to the model, when we're thinking, although there are complex of biological, psychological, cultural, and social factors at play, to my mind, suicidal thoughts emerges and, 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 and individuals who feel trapped, this sense of tra entrapment, this trapped by mental pain, which is often driven by feelings of defeat, humiliation, loss, and rejection. Now, the pathway is much more complicated than that, but in essence, if I'm trying to understand suicidal thoughts, um, that, I think, is key. And indeed, speaking to people who've been suicidal, speaking to loved ones who've lost people to suicide and, and, and research we've done with thousands of people over the years, that sense of entrapment is a key driver, the key driver to the emergence of suicidal thoughts. Now that sense of entrapment could also be driven by social circumstances like my life is not worth living because I've no job to go to, I'm unemployed, I'm worthless, or I'm a burden on my family and friends, or a relationship has broken down and I can see no alternative. And that sense of Tunnel vision, which it often characterizes the suicidal mind, leads to this sense of entrapment. Now, the last bit of the model on the, the right-hand side is this volitional phase. And that volitional phase is going from suicidal thoughts to suicide attempts or death by suicide. Now, the best evidence out there suggests that about 30% of people who have thoughts of suicide will make the transition from thinking about suicide to ending their life. And if we look now in the next slide, I'm going to enlarge that third phase, that volitional phase. And that volitional phase is key to understanding this transition. And again, according to the model, the argument is that people who think about suicide, if they have lots of these presence of these factors in the middle, I call them the eight pillars of behavioral inaction. So these eight factors, the more of these that are present, it increases the likelihood that somebody will act on their thoughts of suicide. Now, I'm not going to go through the, each of these in detail. I'll just highlight a couple of them for the purposes of today's conversation. So the first one is, if I'm thinking of suicide, I've got the access to the means of ending my life. It's not surprising that you're more likely to act on your thoughts of suicide. If I look at the third one there, exposure to suicide or suicidal behavior, we know that if, if we lose a family member or a friend to suicide, we're, we're at risk. It increases our risk of acting on thoughts if times get tough for us in the future. Now, it's really important to note, though, that exposure to suicide is a statistical risk factor. The overwhelming majority of people who lose a loved one to suicide, that exposure, will never become suicidal and will never attempt suicide at all or die by suicide. But it's just important to be vigilant. And then the, there's the impulsivity. The more impulsive one is, the more likely one is to act on their thoughts of suicide. And then one other one I'll just touch on, or two last ones before I 
So we move on to the sort of um, to the um, warning signs. Is it? Uh, we also know that people who are, who are less fearful of dying, and we can assess that they seem to be more likely to act on their thoughts. They're more likely to overcome the life instinct. And then the last one is a really important one: is the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. So if somebody has self harmed or attempted suicide in the past, they're more likely to attempt suicide again in the future. Okay, so I just give you a sense of these key, what I describe as volitional factors, which make it more likely or, um, that somebody will act on their thoughts of suicide. And so when we're thinking about intervening or preventing or keeping people safe, these are the things we want to focus in on, perhaps. Again, just going back to the warning signs I said. So again, what the sort of key messages are, if we're trying to identify if somebody is at risk, um, if they're talking about being trapped, if they're talking about feeling a burden on others, because remember, for so many people, suicide is driven by this sense that they think that they're, they, they're, they're doing their loved ones a favor by ending their life because they feel that they're a burden. That's just utterly, utterly heartbreaking. Uh, but just that, that tunnel vision, that mental pain drives these sorts of thoughts. If we mark changes in people's behaviors can also be an indicator of risk. If somebody's feeling um, stress or under, uh, pain of this mental pain. If we can see, and if there's an unexplained improvement in mood, I would always try and check in with somebody because our concern is that maybe in the depth of the depressive episode, somebody decides that the way to end my pain, the solution to my pain is to end my life. Well, and sadly, then we think their, their, their emotional pain may be alleviate, alleviated because they find a sense, a solution. So these are just giving you some sense of the warn some of the warning signs. Now in the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you some sense then of a bit on the interventions and then the COVID stuff to bring it then to sort of open, hopefully open up the discussion. So we look at what we can do to intervene and, I, uh, and, and protect people. I appreciate this is a busy slide, but what it illustrates, I think, is the breadth of approaches. When we're trying to prevent suicide, we can try to prevent suicide at an individual level which is providing support and crisis services and crisis response and so on. But the reality is the overwhelming majority of people who die by suicide are not in contact with mental health services in the year before they die. So what we need to think about are different ways of keeping people safe. And that's why looking at new technologies, new ways of reaching out and supporting people is so important. But also we need to look at more preventative strategies like destigmatizing suicide and mental health so that people, more people are likely to reach out and, and get the support that they require. And we also know that, there, that in terms of the suicide prevention literature, restricting access to the dangerous means of suicide is also really important. And so work's going on globally to try and really advance our knowledge so we can do that, so we can tackle this unbearable scourge on society. And then just coming towards the last few slides, I just want to highlight something on, on, on partnership working and COVID-19. So again, uh, as I said at the outset, I've been really fortunate in working with colleagues in St. Martins and Scottish Association for Mental Health the last number of years. And when the pandemic hit in, in March last year, um, I was really fortunate to be able to get in touch with um, St. Martins and Sam H, and they agreed with the Mindstep Foundation, another charitable foundation who fund our research, to basically fund a, a tracker study so we could track the mental health and well-being of individuals across the UK because our concern was, as Rachel said at the outset, our concern was that the pandemic would impact on people's mental health. And so from that tracker study, which is still ongoing, what we can tell is that in that first lockdown, in those first six weeks of lockdown last, um, last spring, people's suicidal thoughts did increase. And those suicidal thoughts increased in particular in young people. They increased in particular in people with pre-existing mental health problems. And they increased in particular in people from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. And really important groups when we're thinking moving forward, we need to be, again, protecting and supporting. Now, if we think about what is the impact on people's actual suicide rates, or not people's suicide rates, the international uh, suicide rates. I was involved in a study led by um, Jane Perkis at the University of Melbourne, which published last week. And in Jane's study, 
if I can get the slides to move, in Jane's study, she, she was able to bring together um, data from 21 countries across the world. And it was a first insight in terms of trying to get some sense of whether the pandemic, pandemic has impacted, affected the suicide rates as we'd feared. Now, these data only cover up until the 31st of July, 2020. And the really positive news is in that early phase of the pandemic, there's no evidence that the suicide rates in these 21 countries increased. Now, that's very early on, and very early on, we've had all the economic and social protections in place. Now, our concern is that with data from Japan, for example, very recently shows that the suicide rates have started to increase. So although this is a positive message in terms of the early phase of the pandemic in terms of, and not being inf impacted by the, the, the pandemic, we need to be really, really vigilant because moving on, we, the, our concern is as we recover, that recovery will not be uniform. We know from our data from the UK mental health tracker study is that the mental health of some people is more affected than others. We need to be so, so vigilant moving forward. So just try to bring it to a close and, and hopefully set us up for the, the, the discussion and some final considerations. What I tried to do in those sort of 15 or 17 minutes was give some sense of the idea that suicide is about being trapped by mental pain and, and the people end their life. Not, that's, that's not the driver for why suicide happens, is to make the pain stop. And if we're trying to think about preventing suicide, it takes more than just the treatment of mental illness. It's crucial we tackle inequality. It's vital that we tackle stigma and discrimination. But also going back to this idea that, that often people who are most at risk, those majority of people, upwards more than 70 people, sorry, 70% of people who die by suicide are not in contact with mental health services, statutory services in the 12 months before they die. We have to ask ourselves, are they getting, are we providing the correct help when they need it? Um, and then that idea of thinking about when we're understanding suicide risk, understand that the factors that lead somebody to become suicidal in the first place are different from those that lead people to end their lives, to actually make the transition from thinking to acting on their thoughts. And crucially, we have to prioritize the funding for suicide prevention research, because the reality is just not enough is going into suicide prevention research. 22 times more funding per person effect that goes into cancer research compared to mental health research. And I'm not saying don't fund cancer research, I'm asking for some leveling up. And then just to end and hopefully set us up, is I'm proud to be president of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. And what we just launched uh, two weeks ago was our latest theme for World Suicide Prevention Day, which happened September 10th. And that's this idea that by creating hope through action, we can all do something to help save lives because we all have a role to play in suicide prevention, no matter how big or small. Thank you. Rory, thank you so much for such rich insight. Um, really shocking statistics, actually. Um, I had no idea that globally, every 40 seconds, one person dies by suicide. And that, that is really an incredible number. And um, quite clearly, as you articulated, a real scourge of society and, and something that we all need to take a proactive role in uh, providing intervention for and, and, and support for people who are thinking about uh, taking their own life. Um, now, unsurprisingly, there's been lots and lots of questions coming up in the chat, and um, I kind of wanted to turn to a few of those just before bringing the other panel members in, if that's okay with you. Um, quite a few are referencing some of um, the links to suicide in particular parts of society. So for instance, um, Karen Martin, who is one of our alums, um, she was saying that she works with unpaid carers of all ages um, across Scotland and is seeing an increase in suicidal ideation in unpaid carers, particularly in rural areas. Um, there's also further comments around um, the impact specifically on young people um, and if there are any kind of familial links 
uh, to suicide in young people if, if they had experienced um, the loss of someone through suicide that is close to them, a parent or a sibling, for instance. Mm -hmm. Are there yeah. any targeted interventions that we should be thinking about for groups that are at a higher risk of suicidal ideation? I mean, that's uh, two or three really important issues there. As a Karen, um, thanks, Karen, for those questions. The first bit on unpaid carers. I, I mean, I think that what the um, pandemic has illustrated or has exacerbated is people who, who were vulnerable initially pre-pandemic. Because remember, it's worth noting that although I said that the, there's, the, there's no evidence yet of this, the suicide rates increasing as a consequence of the pandemic, we know in the last couple of years in Scotland, against the backdrop across the whole of the UK of suicide rates increasing in the last couple of years, and that was pre-pandemic. And those increases were obviously were amongst young women and then other groups, but people who are socially disenfranchised, feeling isolated and, and, and burdens and being financially and emotionally burdened. So going back to the and the people, the unpaid carers, of course, that's a group of people we, 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 have, we owe such a debt of gratitude to. And, but they're not, and my argument is, are we giving them, giving them enough support? And, and argue the answer is probably not. And we need to look at that specifically uh, so that we do tailor that support. So I think it's really important. The young people, I am concerned about young people um, in that, because we know that young people's mental health has been getting worse over the last number of years. And we all know that although some people have thrived under under um, the sort of new way of living, we do know that too many young people are struggling. We know that too many young people are waiting on long waiting lists to get access to mental health services. So I'm over 12 months and Billy can speak to this from the work that he's been doing in, in Sam H. So I think we need to look at that and they need, they need to be tailored. Absolutely, we need to get tailored to support. support. The third point about um, bereavement, um, I, it's across different populations and different age groups. So yes, if you if you have lost a loved one in different age, doesn't slightly different statistics in different age groups. But yes, young people who are exposed to suicide, of course they're vulnerable, and of course we need to we need to support them because it's a bereavement first and foremost. And then you've got this added issue of often the stigma associated with suicide. So I think there's lots going on there. But um, my, my answer is we need to. Basically, you know, in Scotland, obviously, we're in the middle of this election period, and there has been manifestos from all and all mental health features and all the government manifestos. I think, from what I can, or all the parties' manifestos. But absolutely, absolutely, after the election, we need to be continuing to make this fight. Mental health has to be a priority, absolutely, and it has to be funded better. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Rory. I'll bring in. Um... Uh, I'll bring in the other panel members now. So welcome back to, to Billy and Liz, and, and thanks again for joining us. Lots of questions coming through. And um, Billy, I might just kind of pick up um, where Rory left off, because I'd be really interested to understand how the work of Sam H has been directly impacted by the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, th there's definitely been an effect, that's for sure. Um, and we might still t be seeing the worst of it to come uh, as the public health emergency and all goes with that um, hopefully begins to take turns for the positives and we've got measurements for it. We're still not sure um, about mental health. Sam is still a big service delivery organisation. So we had registered services with the Care Commission, for example, that had to continue all the way through. Um, a lot of our staff were out still doing face-to-face -face delivery and we maintained that in, in really difficult circumstances during the period. Um, but also a significant number of services went on to blended delivery, often in digital and places like this. Um, and we've had a real mixed response um, when we've been asking those who are being supported through um, those means. And for a lot of them, until such times as I think there's a sophistication around digital delivery and face-to-face -face support for many people who are struggling with their mental health um, is still their preference. And, and our dashboard of kind of demand indicators um, were flashing significantly, still are. Um, our own information service, for example, seen an increase um, in excess of 50% in 12 months. Um, and, and that's mostly the general population and um, many of them looking for information and help seeking um, for the first time. But, but our biggest concern in all this period in terms of the effect on us was people with pre-existing mental health problems. 
Um, and we did some research which has been published. It's, it's called Forgotten. It's on the SAMH website. And there were some really stark statistics in that. So a thousand people who had um, existing mental health problems, 56% said that their mental health worsened and continues um, over, over the period. 27% of their support had just stopped and 13% weren't able to access their GPs. Now, now those systems are still struggling to recover. Um, so therefore, I think the demand um, cycle um, has still to rise to, to peak point um, and post pandemic. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Billy. And Liz, I'll just bring you in now as well, because, you know, interestingly, many people might think of the work that, that Billy does or the work that the Samaritans do as being primarily support organisations. So, you know, fundamentally caring for and helping those at risk. But what role does, does research play? So we, we've heard from Rory about the Suicide Behaviour Research Laboratory. Um, how important are these partnerships with people like Rory to the work that the Samaritans do? Yeah, it's a really good question. It, they're really important. So, of course, our organisation, Samaritans and Sam H, and, and other organisations like ours are crucial to supporting the public at all times and particularly during a time like the pandemic um, and that's our core business we're there to support people provide services provide resources for people but also uh, we, our activity has to be based on evidence so drawing on the work of academic research that rory and his team and other researchers around the world do is crucial to making sure we've got the right services but also the relationships work well both ways because our services provide a really unique view of the picture of mental health and the way the public feel, the way people are accessing support or services or not. And therefore we can feed into the work that is being done within research institutions. So it's really a two way or even more relationship where we can start to understand people, understand things like suicide and influence research and practice in both directions. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much for that, Liz. And um, again, lots of chat and um, very focused on interventions to support young people. And uh, one of the questions that, that's come up in the chat from Sophie Short is, do you think introducing the conversation around mental health and suicide prevention within the school curriculum would decrease the rates of suicide, particularly in young people. Um, so I, I think this has kind of been a, a running theme through many of the questions um, that we've also received in advance. It's, you know, the, the pandemic in particular has had a really profound impact on the mental health of young people. So what can we be doing to support young people? And actually is having more within the school curriculum on mental health actually something that could be really beneficial. So Rory, I'll maybe come back to you first and then um, Billy and Liz, you may want to also comment. I think that's, it is a really important question. Um, now, definitely we, we, we need more mental health in the curriculum. Now, not suicide prevention, so we have to be careful, there's, we have to be careful how we deal with suicide and talking about suicide in, in schools. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be saying doing that ordinarily. Now, if we look at the evidence base, there is evidence that some forms of sort of peer mentorship and peer peer interventions with young people talking about mental health facilitated, that that's been shown in a large randomized clinical study or large, large RCT in Europe to be effective in, ter in terms of suicidal thoughts and attempts. So, so yes, mental health needs to be embedded. We need to be starting this literally, and I would be doing this much in, in, in primary school upwards, so we there's never it's never too early to start talking about mental health in my view, but with that caveat about I wouldn't be talking about suicide specifically. And then another bit would be in terms of going like if we look at Scotland and in, across the UK, there has been in the last few years drive to have more counsellors and support in schools. So I think I, do, I welcome these advances, but I think there is this renewed focus and need to really have that support tailored, but again, without waiting lists and and once, for example, one of the things that's been done in Scotland is a distress brief intervention work that Billy and I are both involved in. And, and one of the things that uh, has been done there is we're, we're piloting moving that 
to uh, for young people to be available in some pilot areas initially so that young people can get access to this if they're in distress can get access to this support the key thing is no waiting list within 24 hours you'll get a response that's the sort of thing we need to do we can't be waiting if we think about the child and adolescent mental health services now i know that's for a particular group of people but we can't have waiting lists which are 12 months long and that's just the reality yeah, and that also goes for the higher education sector as well. And I know that at the University of Glasgow, we have been really investing into shoring up our own counselling support and providing resources to our own student community to support them, not just at this time, but at any time. And I think mm -hmm. being able to get quick access to experts in this sphere is just so crucial. So I think there's a lot of work for the higher education sector to do in this space as well. And, and Billy, I don't know if there's anything that you would want to add to that. Just I think Sophie is right in terms of that being such a priority. I think linking it, as Rory said, to suicide prevention, the evidence doesn't have to show that you know that would be the thing to do. But, but we have seen, we've been working in schools all across Scotland for a number of years now, did the biggest ever um, survey of teachers around mental health and children, and we've learned a lot. And we know that efforts in schools can build the mental health literacy. It helps with anti-stigma work of young people and therefore help seeking of young people is improved and when they have those capacities built in through school. And I would make the decision or um, the distinction between older and younger people. We could see through the COVID um, research that actually that was the group that we had um, concerns for. And um, there, there were areas of um, feeling isolated and loneliness that hadn't been expressed by uh, that group of young people to the extent that they were expressing it. And they need a different response. And but fundamentally, in Scotland and other places, the supports uh, for children and young people are based on thresholds of mental illness and, and suicidal ideation. And, and there has to be something else in place. We reject 8,000 referrals a year for young people who are referred to CAM still in Scotland. Um, and, and that's just not right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Liz, um, kind of just sticking to this theme around um, the impact on young people in particular, what do you think the role of social media is in this sphere, either positively or negatively? Yeah, it, it is. Um, and, and, and you frame that nicely because it is complicated. Um, and it's mixed. The impact of social media isn't straightforward. Um, social media plays a huge part in people's lives, whether young, old, middle-aged, you know, it's it's there for everybody. Lots of people use it. Um, it can be hugely beneficial for people um, in providing social connections, particularly at the moment, right, where we can't get to people. It's hugely beneficial for pe keeping people connected. Um, it can provide safe spaces that don't exist offline for people to discuss topics that are difficult, to share stories of hope and recovery and their struggles, and that can inspire others to keep going. Um, there's loads of great things that social media provides the opportunity for, but it also does have the um, potential to create harmful spaces. Um, and we should be mindful that content affects everybody differently. I think um, lots of people are getting used to the idea that as you share content, you should be mindful about how that is viewed. We see lots of things with trigger warnings on it, regardless of the topic. People are mindful of that, but we have to, particularly with suicide prevention, suicide and self-harm and mental health, ensure that we keep those spaces safe. And we've been doing some work at Samaritans um, within a wider research program about online harms, trying to identify what makes content harmful and what makes people react in certain ways to certain types of content, even if it's well-meaning, even if people just want to share their experiences. Um, and we've been working with social media companies to work out how do we moderate content without taking away people's agency and censoring content, because I don't think that's the approach, but how do we create better and safe spaces that harness that opportunity to do good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, Billy, I might just come to you because of course we're talking a lot about the impact on, on young people. Um, but also what are your views on uh, 
what more employers could be doing for their staff because of course over the course of the last year our working environments have changed drastically from what we we once knew if if not loved um, but what do you think that employers could be doing in this space to better support staff it's a really key um, aspect of all of this um, and there's probably a few things to, to first of all note um, around 70 percent um, of people who lose their life to suicide um, are in a job um, when when that happens um, and therefore place-based bereavement support and um, suicide can be death like no other um, and i think whilst those ripples that, that rory talked about and family and, and carers and people really close to loved ones um, in workplaces and in universities um, and in other places where people gather, um, the impact of, of that is, is huge. So, so we would like to see um, significantly um, improved uh, support um, in workplaces when, when that happens. Also, the, the COVID research with employees um, demonstrated that 56% of people um, were asked, talked about their mental stress um, worsening um, as the pandemic um, played out. And, and our evidence at Sam H is there's a lot of displaced help seeking into workplaces. As the mental health system was challenged, and um, those who were trying to, 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 to seek help and were finding that difficult, waiting times were long, some services weren't available. Um, and workplaces, as we all worked in, and many in different places, were reporting to us and asking us um, to come in and help with us. So something for them to be aware of. But we would advocate a whole systems approach for employers not to see this as something to be fixed or a sticking plaster of yeah. you know a first aid approach mental health first aid is a really important asset that you can have but it should be inside and um, something that starts with your stigma and culture in the workplace you should build a conceptual framework that looks at health and security and relationships and environment and all of that should be your mental health at work response rather than just seeing it as how we support people, train our staff, have good policy. That's important too. Um, but actually the best employers um, are the ones who demonstrate that whole system approach. And, and we've got some really good examples in Scotland and, and we need more. Yeah, and, and just sticking with you, Billy, if I may, because if you had a magic wand, what would be the priority improvements you would make to mental health services in Scotland in particular, but you may want to broaden that out to the, the UK or in fact, across the globe. Yeah, Rory's smiling because this could go on for a while. Um, I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> the campaigning organisation as well as a service delivery organisation, you know, and, and I do think we're at a moment in time on mental health and we've recognised that organisationally, but, but I think um, coming out of this period, now is the time for us to be big in our thinking and radical in our action. Um, and, and from a sort of international point of view, we're lucky to have, you know, um, Rory and his team here based in Glasgow and um, where we can access people and research. And, and that's a real asset that we have in Scotland. Um, but it's good to be part of an international community that Scotland is at the forefront um, of, of learning from. But, but to your core point, it is election season in Scotland and Sam H published its manifesto in February. And I encourage everybody to go and have a look at it. It's got 38 policy asks in there. Um, so we're not short of, of a few. Our three main are um, improving the access to psychological therapies for adults. The wait is far too long. The breadth of the services and support you can get there um, is too narrow. There's only one health board in Scotland out of 14 meeting a waiting time target. We've already touched on children and young people and the systems of support that are put in place for there. When someone's um, referred um, to, for support around their psychological well-being of a young person, they should get it the first time they ask. They should not have to demonstrate through long processes and that they're ill enough to, to be seen. Um, and thirdly, of course, our, our call is on suicide prevention. We want to see a 10-year commitment and a better resource plan for it in Scotland. We've created a brilliant lived experience movement. Again, if people are not aware, look at United to Prevent Suicide. It's a new social movement that's backing all that we're trying to do in Scotland. And as well as a lot of assets um, underneath that campaign um, banner, it's about getting people to claim this agenda and work through communities to try and make a difference, because we all can. Yeah. Can I just add on there? Thanks so to that? Yeah, please, uh, Rory. So, I mean, I agree entirely with Billy, and, and I am smiling because, obviously, 
Billy's incredibly passionate about this, and I've, I've heard him speak so much about it in such a positive and constructive way across Scotland for many years. That's the key thing for me is that, in addition to what Billy said, is is what sometimes it's described as these under the radar suicides, people who aren't in contact with clinical services, right? So that's the majority of people. Now, they may be in contact with Smartens and they may be in contact with other organizations, but they're not in contact with statutory services. I think, we, that, to me, that, that needs to be, that's a, a really tricky question to address. But, but I think part of that is addressing stigma, speaking to people, men and others who are most at risk and see what they actually need and make sure they get it when they, when they, when they need it. But I think there's something also about looking at what other services and things that men do access. So we know that people who die by suicide, between 60 and 80% of young people, for example, will have been in contact with their GP. Now, not necessarily in the, in the period before, six months, I think it is, before they die. Now, not talking about mental health necessarily, not talking about suicide. What we need to do is have a system in place, and I totally accept that huge demands on GPs, but I think we need to think differently and in a more innovative way to ensure that all contacts which an individual has with, a, in this case, a health professional is an opportunity for an intervention, an opportunity to ask that question if you're concerned, ask them directly, are you having, think, having thoughts of suicide? And then there's ways in which you can respond about keeping people safe in terms of safety plans and other responses. So to me, that's a big challenge. We haven't cracked that yet. And I would like us as not just in Scotland, but internationally, that's something we're really trying to tackle. And then just one other thing on that, which is this whole idea of, Billy said, I, I'm, are united again, um, to prevent suicide is a brilliant, I mean, we've worked hard in, in, in this National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group um, at, at the Scottish government level. And, and that uh, has emerged out of working closely with people with lived experience to see what they think is important, how we galvanize and grow this social movement, all of us moving together in the same direction to prevent suicide. Because I know it sounds like a cliche, but genuinely suicide is preventable up until the last moment. And all of us, all of us can do something to help. Yeah. And I, I also I, I can, I want, I want, oh, sorry, please, Liz. Sorry, I think there's a little bit of a delay as well. Thanks. No, I just wanted to add in on the theme of missed opportunities. I agree with all of that. I think that's absolutely right. And particularly in healthcare and service settings, that's crucial. But it's also the case in other aspects of life. If we just think about suicide prevention, from a healthcare perspective or a mental health perspective, then we miss a whole load of other opportunities in people's lives where intervention is possible and creating safe spaces for people. So um, we recently did some research with uh, middle-aged men who had lived experience of suicidal thoughts. And what they were saying was there was all of these missed opportunities when they had lost their jobs, when their relationships had broken down, when other stuff had happened in their lives where we can be sharing the evidence, sharing our knowledge about when might some of these things come up and when can you refer people? When can you just ask somebody, that's really hard, are you okay? Because yeah. difficult stuff happens all the time. And I think that's what we have to do. Like Rory said, be innovative and think outside the box. This isn't just about services. And if it is also about services, how do we reframe those so they don't look like traditional mental health services and they appeal to people that need them the most? Yeah, no, great, great points. And I feel like we could we could keep talking about this for, for quite some time, but um, I want to try and get through just a couple of more questions, I think in the six minutes, unbelievably, that we have left. Um, and Rory, I might, I might just come back to you because one of the key roles of the Institute of Health and Wellbeing is to design and evaluate evidence-based interventions. Um, and when you think about that, obviously it will be really useful to think about the interventions that you think have been most effective. But I also want to pick up on something that has been raised in the chat on a, on a couple of occasions now as well. And that's around the sense that greater inequalities in society lead to greater risk of suicide. You know, is there a phenomenon so-called as the Glasgow effect that is linked to you know, um, a high number of suicides as a result of kind of poverty and substance abuse? Well, just to take that, the last point first, I don't know if it, it would quite qualify as a Glasgow effect, without, without a shadow of a doubt, 
and it, there's this inequalities gradient and that um and so you're at least three times more likely to die by suicide if you're from more socially socially disadvantaged background compared to obviously more affluent background and when we try and understand or explain why there's no simple explanation part of it is to do with yeah um comorbidities and sort of multimorbidities and drug and alcohol use as part of that um basically intergenerational unemployment um a sense in which early life trauma is endemic so one of the things we do know is that the exposure to early life trauma is such a driver for poor mental and physical health and it's never inevitable just because you're from a socially disadvantaged background who experiences trauma that does not mean that you will definitely die by suicide but it means that there maybe are some extra vulnerabilities and it's crucial what we need to do is when we think of of services and responses, not just taking up Liz's point, I totally agree. Suicide prevention is this public health priority, which requires thinking about health services, thinking about employment, thinking about education, but making sure that these services, whatever way we want to frame them, are trauma informed. And we recognize that people who, one of the reasons why, for example, we know that men are less, men from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to seek help. It's because maybe they don't trust people in positions of what they perceive as authority or positions in which people have been treated so badly in the past, why would they go back? And so one of the messages, the sort of themes at work that we do, for example, in the distress brief intervention-based work and all the work that all of us engage in, in this call is compassionate response, treating people with dignity and respect and, treating, and seeing that as a human right, a basic human right. And that's when we'll start to tackle this really ingrained intergenerational inequality absolutely center so that was a long way around about getting there but i think i got there and then the the other point um what was the first point sorry rachel well actually do you know what i'm going to come back and ask you this as a quick okay. fire round at the end because one of the things that you've raised um has led me on to another aspect of the chat that's been mentioned by a few people, but Jude Stevenson um, has specifically asked it in the Q&A around um, prison suicide. And it kind of links in, I think, to much of what you have already said about the perhaps inability to get the support required within that kind of setting. So I don't know whether just very quickly you might want to say something about any research that's been done um, around suicide within the prison system. Well. I mean, I'll just say very briefly about this. I think it's it's an important priority area. We know that um, obviously risk of suicide is particularly high in some in, in remand people who are in remand and newly um, sentenced. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that people who often are in prison setting are bringing with them a whole range of pre-existing risk factors for suicide. And I think we need to do much more about trying to intervene and and, and alleviate that risk. Well done, Rory. Thank you for that. Sorry, that kind of put you in the spot when we've got like two two minutes to go. So actually, just very quickly, I want to kind of finish off by um, doing a, a, a quick uh, round robin with you all. Um, really just to sort of highlight uh, from each one of you what your priority area of research is going forward in this space. So, uh, Billy, if I maybe come to you first, you know, is there a priority research area or intervention that you think needs to be more prevalent? Sure, and, and, and we are very likely to be knocking on Rory's door again, having done now um, a couple, and, and still funding PhD research at Glasgow. There, there's probably three things for us. One is those um, particular at-risk groups where we just have not seen enough research. So whether that's the LGBT community, the black and minority ethnic, veterans is another community, and they've got elevated risks um, for, um, for certain reasons. So, so at-risk groups. Second one would be workplace, just based on the conversation and responses that you got to, to that question. Um, and I think employers are coming kind of slow to that agenda. Um, and there's some concerns in Scotland in particular around SMEs um, as a group um, and just what their capacities and capabilities are. Um, and, and third is, and I'm pleased to say, I think um, it's moving in the right direction, is stigma. Um, some really deliberative stigma and um, suicide work um, in Scotland. Um, I've seen some things internationally, but not particularly um, close by. And with the, the CME campaign to which Sam H is a managing partner, it's a logical extension um, to be working in partnership with them um, and yourselves. And uh, I hope we can bring that to bear. That's great. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, Liz, I'll come to you. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, much of our focus will be the same as what Billy has mentioned, the at-risk groups, um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds and marginalised groups. That's, of course, really important um, and driven by what we already know about risk factors. So people who self-harm, particularly young people, and we're seeing those um, rates of self-harm and mental illness rise within those groups. For me, one of the really important things um, from a research perspective is it necessarily the topics that we research in terms of risk factors, but how we decide and how we conduct that research? And is that done through the lens of people with lived experience? Are they informing how decisions about research funding get made? Are we using people's experiences to generate our research programs and allowing people to be part of the research process so having lived experience and peer researchers conducting the research so we're not looking through our external researcher mm -hmm. lens but looking at the results and the findings through the people who we're trying to help eyes as well so i think that's the change i would like to see within suicide prevention research that we start to reshape it and reframe it um, and, and uh, uh, another sort of point on top of that, the issue of data, suicide data and real time data is so important. Understanding in real time who is at risk will help us a prevent suicides um, and identify trends quickly, but help us shape our research that can happen that is then more actionable in real time. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Liz. And Rory, do you have anything that you would like to add to what Billy and Liz have already said? Well, I'm just uh, uh, conscious of the time. So just to, I agree with whatever uh, everything Billy and Liz have said. Two, two maybe quick ones, which would be um, a per so a personalised um, treatment response or intervention response, which is theory driven and evidence based. So one of the things I try to allude in the, the, my presentation is one of the big questions we have is, understanding who's more likely to act on their thoughts of suicide and that's something which we've done quite a lot of work on recently and i think there's a lot i think that that's a really important area for us to better understand and then maybe use that the information you get from that to inform these personalized responses and that part of that personalized response will hopefully help address in part that point i made earlier about these people who are not in contact with mental health services or any services and that they really are struggling and they would benefit from, from help and support. Thank you so much for that, Rory. Um, I would genuinely love to continue this conversation, but I am afraid we are completely out of time for today's event. So I would just like to take the opportunity to thank once again um, our fantastic guest speakers for their insights uh, to Rory, to Billy and to Liz. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to the resources available in the chat as well. And if you would like to know more about Rory's work or the Institute of Health and Wellbeing or the Samaritans or the Scottish Association for Mental Health, please do use the links located at the top of the chat or within the event description. Uh, thank you to you, our audience, for joining us today for this really important topic. Um, a link to the recording will be circulated uh, along with a link for some feedback. Please do help us out with that if you can. It will literally take a moment, but it really does help shape and inform what we do. As you know, you have joined us for the third in our series of World Changing Glasgow Conversations. Many thanks for listening and for your fabulous engagement in the chat. Uh, it's a goodbye for now, but we really do look forward to connecting again with you soon. In the meantime, please stay safe and take care.